This episode of Luther and Answers is brought to you by our sponsor, Dial a Podcast. Dial a Podcast, proud sponsor of Luther and Answers, provides a simple yet powerful solution to bring your church's sermons and Bible studies closer to those who might be a step away from the digital world. Getting started with a local telephone number is easy, allowing anyone to listen to your content with just a phone call at their convenience. It's an excellent way for congregations of all size to extend their reach. Get started with a 30-day risk-free trial at dialapodcast.com and ensure no one misses out on your church's messages. Reverend Dr. Jason Goodham, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited to wrap up Jonah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excited that uh, you won't have to come back on this crappy show anymore. Why did we agree to three? No, I'm kidding. I'm just grateful we didn't do like Jeremiah or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Not only, um, not only is it long, but everything about it is long, and it's a slog to read. So, Jeremiah, I mean, yeah. Well, also my notes, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So today we're doing Jonah three and four, and that'll that'll wrap us up on Jonah. Yeah, uh, I, this is. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, I actually have, speaking of your notes, I have them. You were gracious enough to send them to me. Very good. Okay. I guess we should read Jonah chapter three and four. Yeah, go for it. Excellent. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three-day journey across. Jonah began to enter the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, In forty days' time Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he made a proclamation in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, no man or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not eat or drink water. Uh, Both man and animal shall cover themselves with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows, God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their actions that that they turned from their evil ways, he changed his mind about the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now this greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own land? This is the reason that I fled before to Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in faithfulness, and ready to relent from punishment. Therefore, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made for himself a booth there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to provide shade over his head, to provide comfort from his grief. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose... God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah so that he became faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah replied, It is right for me to be angry even to death. The Lord said, You are troubled about the plant for which you did not labor and did not grow. It came up in a night and perished in a night. 
Should I not therefore be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? That's where it ends, huh? Yeah. Cliffhanger. Waiting for a sequel. Yep. Yep. Thankfully, I hear there's a charismatic guy who has been to Heaven's Library, and he can likely find the sequel for us. Probably. So what's going on here? Well, it's the 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 literary structure of Jonah is absolutely brilliant. And so uh, chapter one and chapter two relate to each other in the same way as chapter three and chapter four, but in reverse order. Okay. So in chapter one, jo- Jonah is careless about the lives of others and disobedience to God. In chapter two, he has his repentance and thanks God for his mercy. Uh, in chapter three, Jonah obeys God and proclaims uh, God's word. And in chapter four, Jonah is careless about the lives of others and selfishly sins against God. Uh, but at the same time, you, you've got this, I mean, they're meant to play against each other. So that you question Jonah's repentance. It's kind of the purpose of the book is that you are wondering who Jonah is while getting a complete picture of who God is. Hmm. So, um, digging into chapter three here, what, uh, what are kind of some themes or some things we should be looking for specifically in chapter three? Uh, In chapter three, it's all about the power of the word of God and the simple faith of the Ninevites. The, The Ninevites are occupy the same space in Jonah as the sailors did at the end of chapter one. It's a very simple faith but we are not permitted to doubt that it's anything but authentic. Uh, mm. So you, you'll you notice that nowhere in chapter three in relation to the Ninevites is uh, the covenant name used. Mm. And yet there is a real response to God's word. So the covenant name is used in verse one and verse three. Uh, and after that, it's only God. It's not the. It's not Yahweh, but it's a very simple faith, and yet it is an authentic faith. And this is, um, I guess, this really does contrast nicely against Jonah, who uh, appears to have this very layered kind of faith, right? This sort of deep understanding or supposedly uh but is also not very authentic right that's his... exactly the point remember jonah's a court prophet uh he's got a lot of nationalistic pride in being an israelite and um, maybe most importantly for the purposes of the book he has all the right answers uh, mm. even if we cheat ahead to chapter four he he confesses I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Yeah. He knows that. He's got all the right answers and it doesn't impact his life one iota because God doesn't respond in the way that Jonah wants him to. I like that when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah this second time, um, he's pretty immediate about heading to Nineveh, it seems. Uh, (laughs) it seems like the fish was enough to get him on task. (laughs) Yeah. If it wasn't the fish, it was the storm. Uh, it it was a lot of things. Jonah at least knows what the score is at uh, (laughs) chapter three, verse one. He knows what's going to happen to him. Uh, and, and he goes, uh, I, I get the sense that Jonah's preaching in verse four is entirely reluctant. Yeah. 
that that there, there's not an there's not a sense of earnestness or or uh inflection to what he does it's kind of like yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown I am technically following the letter of the law yeah I can actually if if I found out that that was literally all he said he just walked through the city shouting in 40 days the city's going to be overthrown over and over I would really not be shocked like if that was just the exact yeah. prophecy oh, I'm almost positive that's exactly what he did yeah, it's I, I I'm certain that's what he did because he's a letter of the law kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, and this may be jumping ahead a little bit, and it's it's I don't know that it's in your notes, but I like that the Bible says God doesn't change His mind, right? God even says that of Himself. Um, uh, that you know, am I am I a man that I would lie, a son of man that I would change my mind? So like. There's this idea that God is unchanging, eternal, everlasting, everlasting, that he doesn't change his mind. But very frequently yep. in the Bible, God does change his mind. And every time God does change his mind, it is always without fail to incline himself to mercy. Every time. It's, yep. He always changes his mind to mercy. So, so the attribute is is called divine immutability, and what we learn about the divine immutability is that it's not that God hasn't decided what He's going to do with the Ninevites; it's that the real purpose of God's judgment and condemnation is repentance. Right. Uh, God never ever uses the law for the sole purpose of smiting. God always uses the law that we might turn. And when we turn, God turns from anger to mercy. And so it's mm. God doesn't change as if he's uncertain. God changes actually according with his will. Mm, that's good. That's good. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, dig in. I guess we can take it uh, section by section. What's the first little bit we need to look at here then? So first section is verses one through five, and that's the actual act of preaching and the initial repentance of the Ninevites. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. It's almost identical uh, phraseology as from the first time the word of the Lord comes to Nineveh. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message I tell you. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of interpretation in Bible translation, but I mean, Jonah's pronouncing judgment on his enemies. He should be thrilled about this. You mm, know, uh, he, he should kind of take some sort of sadistic joy. He's not thrilled about it because he knows the right answers. So Jonah goes mm. and he goes into Nineveh. And you know, Nineveh is an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. There's some question about what that means, uh, whether it takes three days to walk across or three days to walk around or whether it's just hyperbole. But, but, for ancient standards, Nineveh's really, really big. That's the baseline thing. And, and so, uh, you know, Jonah is trying to do the bare minimum in, in his simple sermon, I believe is five words in Hebrew, uh, <laughs> and says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Hmm. And you you go from that to the faith. The, the God is so blunt in this book. It's it's kind of ridiculous how blunt God is everywhere in this book. And so Jonah preaches, and, and right away, all we get is, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Right. And that's that's good enough. You know? And we want to tack so much extra onto faith. Even as Christians, we want to we want to tack so much extra, and God and the people of Nineveh believed God. And there it is. That's amazing. Um, uh, 
I like this uh, in your notes. You have this little Luther quote here that. Um, oh, yeah. Is very good. Uh, Neither Christ nor all the apostles and prophets were ever to bring, ever able to bring Jerusalem to that point by means of their words and their miracles, though they ministered to it for a long time and preached from one end of the city to the other. God might exclaim here too, as Christ did in Matthew 8 10 about the centurion, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Because they, it, I mean, it was the, the way this is written, um, the implication is that it's like literally the whole city, every person, man, woman, and child, you know, it's not, uh, yeah. it's not just most of the city or the King. It's, it's the whole city, the people of Nineveh. And it, it gets us back to the idea of faith as a miracle. Mm. Okay. You know, it yeah. kind of obliterates the American Christian notion that faith is mental assent to a series of facts. And, yeah. you know, this is miraculous faith if the entire capital city of the Ninevites turns to faith, but it's what God does in the heart of every believer upon conversion, whether that's at baptism or in adulthood, is that he creates faith, he creates new life in a dead man. Hmm. And it's interesting, too, because that gets back to the faith is here before the repentance, you know? Yeah. And it's, now certainly repentance is necessary for faith. We can't just keep on sinning so that grace may abound. You know, there's that whole Romans 6 caveat. But it's also, it's a caution for us against the the tendency we have to make repentance our contribution, like our good works part of the deal. Um, can we talk about the, the decree of the king for just a second? Is that skipping ahead too yeah. much? Do we, do we need to no, go no, back No, no, go for it. It's or? just fine. Um... He made no, we, even the we'll animals. do the degree of the king, and then sorry, he made the even the animals you know, no, it's fast fine. and put on sackcloth. Yep. It. I mean, there. There's a completeness to the repentance. But but also you you get a sense of the naivety of their faith, which is again, it's a beautiful thing here. Yeah. You know, it's for for the pagan mind, everything comes from a position of superstition. And and so like making the cattle repent is you, you don't fully comprehend what God is like, but you know that he's mad and you know that he wants you to turn from your wicked ways. And so, you think, well, even well, if the cattle are guilty, we, we better throw some sackcloth on them, too. Right, let's cover but, all the bases. But, let's cover all of our bases. But what's so interesting about that is there's there's just a hint of Romans 8 in that, isn't there? There's just a hint that the whole of creation is groaning under the weight of sin, and yeah. all of creation is waiting to be restored. And the 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 theology of the redemption of creation in Jonah is right there waiting for us to notice it if we're paying attention. Hmm. Uh, any other little tidbits out of the decree of the king that we should uh, look towards, you think? I, I think... I think we want to pay attention to not only did the people and the animals put on sackcloth, but it's probably the most notable that the king put on uh, sackcloth. Uh, the This would have been unheard of in the ancient world. Uh, mm. Everything in the ancient world was about status and about identification. And the king does this and he clothes himself with sackcloth and he sits in ashes and just for a second, uh, Jonah is not the type of Christ, but the king is the type of Christ. Hmm. The king also, um, the only one to sit in ashes, 
explicitly in the text. Yeah. Yep. And and you you get the sense of the king taking responsibility for the sins of his people. And uh, mm. that is a strong picture of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then Jonah is then shifted out of that sort of type of Christ chair. And now Jonah is identifying uh, probably more with us in our day to day, uh, you know, and how we feel about all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Well, and in, in what at, at, at the point when the king ret- repents, what happens is that Jonah abandons the word of God and he becomes the people of Israel. And, and mm. so insofar that we identify with the people of Israel and their obstinance and their stubbornness, but there is a very strong typology of suddenly Jonah uh, sheds the type of Christ imagery and he puts on the people of Israel imagery. It's probably, I, I mean, maybe this is skipping ahead or uh, whatnot, but it, it's it's interesting, too, that the Ninevites, these would have been Gentiles, right? These aren't. Yep. These aren't Israelites. So it's interesting that the repentance and the acceptance of that repentance, right, the forgiveness offered by God to the Gentiles makes the Israelite guy even more stubborn and obstinate. And like, we see that exact thing play out in the New Testament, in the book of Acts and, and throughout the gospels, we see that exact same thing play out. Yeah. It's, it's a major theme in scripture. It's, it's, especially you see it in the minor prophets in the old Testament, but God intended the chosen people of Israel as a physical people to be a city on a hill, to be a light that drew the world to themselves. And immediately upon being chosen, the people of Israel isolated themselves. They rejected Mm. the Gentiles and their, their election became a source of pride to the point of being a stumbling block for them. Isn't that just like us, man? Good Lord. That's like the most human oh creature thing i have ever heard oh that's exactly how we are it's uh we we as soon as we receive something from god we immediately begin the the work of convincing ourselves we deserved it yeah 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 that's exactly right that's exactly right what's the next little tidbit here in chapter 3 we need to look at well i uh, i think the last thing we want uh to point out is just simply verse 10 uh when god saw what they did how they turned from their evil way god relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it and and so uh the repentance uh of the ninevites reveals God's own, we would say, repentant heart. And and mm. we, we say this in a, in a purely theological sense, not because God needs forgiveness, but because God's motion in turning from his wrath mirrors our own motion in turning from our sin. Yeah. That's excellent. That's so good. Um, take Take us through chapter four jonah uh just being absolutely out of pocket and a total jerk about this whole thing (laughs) uh chapter four is basically it's a little old testament the whole chapter stands in the place of the old testament and the story of the history of the people of israel jonah uh comes out of the ocean, he comes out of the water, he moves into the wilderness, and he immediately starts to grumble against God. <laughs> it's it's remarkable. It is remarkable. <laughs> yeah, it's uh so he he <laughs> he he grumbles against God because he knows the right answer. He knows about their deliverance and and I, it's a little bit of an interpretive leap, but the, the rest of the chapter ties it in. What we'll notice is if you go back to Exodus 15, when the Israelites come out of the water and they're celebrating and, and, and they're, they're partying, 
the the last section in Exodus 15 is they start to grumble because there's no meat. Mm. Right, they get hungry and they're like, "Oh God, you brought us out to the wilderness to die." And and the same move is done by Jonah. Is the people, uh, the the Ninevites repent. It's like, God, why did you send me on this mission if you're just going to glorify my enemies? Hmm. And what, very... what's so interesting about chapter? F- we very much want to um, call bears out of the forest or call lightning or yeah. fire down on our enemies, right? Yep. We, yeah, the, we would much rather be Elisha. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the saying in, in biblical interpretation is that Nahum got to write the book Jonah wanted to write because Nahum comes after Jonah and then absolutely just lights up the Ninevites. Uh, it's a pretty, <laughs> you know, condemnatory book. Uh, and, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta have this sense, uh, if you have a sense of humor, of Jonah sitting there in heaven uh, watching God give Nahum his message. He's like, what gives? Why can't <laughs> yeah. I do this? <laughs> you know, that sort of a thing. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the most, well, I don't even know if I can say it, but the most astounding part of chapter four is Jonah's confession of faith and how that it hasn't produced faith in his heart. I mean, it's, it's mm. like, I, I still, I've, I've read this book hundreds of times and I still don't know what to do with verse two of chapter four. Hmm. And it's, um, It's it's got to be it's got to be monergistic too, um, because he says, "Is this not what I said would happen when I was still back back home?" So, like, not only did he know that, like, he knew the message would be effective, and he knew that God would spare yep. them. So he has to know that God is the one that's going to create the faith, right? That God is creating the faith. That God is giving the repentance as it were he like he has to know this uh to know that it's going to be effective and, and then be upset by it yeah you you really get the sense that if if we if we try to fill in the gaps on what we know about Jonah's life we know that he's a court prophet but you know kind of last week we left it as an open question of whether or not he's one of those charlatan prophets or whether he was an authentic prophet and i think i think the end of the first part of chapter four gives us a really good sense that jonah was an authentic prophet like he knew the power of the word of the lord but he was in the process of being corrupted Mm. and this ends up being god's way to save him as well right we we assume we assume jonah ultimately came to repentance uh, being as he wrote this book. Yep. It's, uh, and I take this from Dr. Reed Lessing, but if you assume Jonah wrote the book of Jonah, and that's what all of the traditions all the way back say, then the evidence is that Jonah wrote the book, right? That's right. the evidence of his repentance. But, you know, there, there's just so many parallels in Jonah and you, you have to believe that Jesus and giving the parable of the prodigal son uh, used this same exact tactic uh, when he left the, you know, the, the repentance of the older brother wide open when he was talking to the Pharisees. You know, mm. there, there's no conclusion to that parable. And, and because Jesus so readily identified himself with Jonah, you have to believe that he was thinking about Jonah when he told the parable of the older son. And, you know, Jonah is the older son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. Wow. Wow. Uh the the other major parallel we, we want to identify at this point is now Jonah also becomes the anti Job. Huh. Yeah. And so uh Jonah begs for death 
<laughs> but he doesn't beg for death because everything's been taken away from him. He begs for death because everything has been restored to him and he's a man of prosperity and he just can't handle God's goodness. That's amazing. I, uh, I, have, I have some thoughts. Uh, I think we're probably a couple sections away from where I, I, I have some thoughts, but uh, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, a pin in it uh, when we get there, we get there. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jonah confesses this amazing thing that God is gracious, slow to anger, abundant in faithfulness, ready to relent from punishment, and then follows that up with, therefore, take my life from me. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> like, what a clown. Golly. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's it's like it's the equivalent of receiving holy communion and 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 saying god i realize how awesome you are you better kill me now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then like i love how like god's response to Jonah is just like why are you mad? <laughs> yes. The God's mercy isn't reflected in his patience with the Ninevites. I mean, it's right there. God's right. mercy is reflected in his patience with Jonah. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess the next bit starts there at verse 5. Uh, Jonah went out of the city and sat down yeah. east of the city. Um. He's a part that and made a there. booth for himself. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, imagery, 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 and more imagery. Uh, what does Jonah do uh, after a, a he abandons the word of God and he moves east? That's Garden mm. of Eden imagery. Right. Mm. So he, he, he abandons the presence of God with his word and he moves east. And then what does he do? He makes a booth for himself, and that's wilderness wandering imagery. Yes. So Jonah is intentionally trying to identify himself with the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. He, he, he's trying to make this about his suffering. And the ironic thing in that is why were the Israelites wandering in the wilderness? Is their own, because they uh, were disobedient and rebellious yeah. to God. Yep. <laughs> oh, I love this guy. That's so great. Uh, so yeah, it's amazing. Verse six, the Lord appoints a plant, which this goes back to the fish. The Lord appointed a fish. Um, yep. And now the Lord's appointing a plant to comfort Jonah. This is the bit. Um, it says Jonah was very happy about the plant. He does not thank God for the plant. <laughs> He's just very happy about the magic plant that grew up. Um, <laughs> but then when the plant goes away and the wind comes and the sun, Jonah's like all ready to blame God for that stuff. You know? Yeah. He's like, all right, oh, just yeah. let me die already. <laughs> Oh, why, oh, why, God, do you hate me so much? <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, I mean, it's, you almost can't handle how ridiculous Jonah is in this last chapter. Yeah. It's, it's almost more than we can bear. And so we, we just kind of smooth over it. But if you, if you dissect chapter four down into its component parts, it's as, it, I mean, it's as unrelentingly biting as any text in all of Scripture. Yeah. Tell me, tell me more about the the plant and the worm and the wind and the sun. Do you, I'm I'm sure you have some notes on this. <laughs> yeah. So the the plant, is, the word for the plant is a kikayon plant. It's it's just transliteration. Uh, uh, the footnote in my Bible says it's probably a castor oil plant. Uh, again, I don't think it is. 
I think this plant is the same type of special creation that the fish was in chapter one. I, you know, I think we, I think we, we don't plant, have any other reason to believe that. I, I think the plant lends credence to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a it's just a plant. It's a special Jonah plant created for his own repentance, just like it was the special Jonah fish created for his own repentance. And then again, the the imagery, I mean, it, it blows my head up when I think about this. So just within the book. The, the the Kikayon plant is in direct contrast to the seaweed that threatened to drown Jonah. Hmm. So uh, God uses a plant to try to, to kill Jonah. God uses a plant to save Jonah. But then I we really, you miss the significance of the plant unless you catch the Garden of Eden imagery. Okay. Right. What did Adam and Eve try to cover themselves with after they sinned? Plants. Plants. Uh, God here intentionally covers Jonah with his plant, and then the plant immediately fades. The plant immediately withers. And that's exactly what would have happened with... uh, uh, Adam and Eve sing. And it is Isaiah 64, verse 6. Uh, all our good deeds are like a filthy rag, and we all like a fig, we all like a leaf has withered, and we have blown away in the wind. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's Jonah language. That's exactly what happens is God appoints a worm, and this is probably a special Jonah worm. Uh, and he uh appoints a wind, which is the east wind, the the wind that blows off the desert. And it scorches the plant, and and God is sitting there screaming at Jonah, trying to get his attention, saying, "Repent, repent, repent, repent! Why will you not do what the Ninevites did?" Then God says to Jonah. <laughs> Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Once again, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? Like, and, and, uh, you know, and God elaborates, you didn't grow the plant. You didn't, why are you so mad? Yeah, it's, uh, it's unreal. Uh, Unfortunately, Remy, I got to pause right here. Okay. I think I've got someone showing up at my office. All right. All right. So, um, God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, not only is it right for me to be angry about the plant, but also <laughs> I should die. I want to die. He's like throwing <laughs> the world's biggest temper tantrum. So I, I'm not the biggest veggie tales fan in the world. Uh, but in the veggie tales, Jonah movie, I think they more or less nailed this scene. Uh, when, <laughs> when Archibald, the asparagus throws a tantrum in the desert. But yeah, he he's an obstinate child throwing a tantrum for not being able to control God. Hmm. And and this is where where the imagery with Job comes full circle. Because so the the entire book of Job after after his friends have have you know done the good service of completely being the worst friends in the history of friends uh all Job wants to do is he wants a uh, he wants an audience with God, mm-hmm. and so in Job, the the God shows up, and in Job, uh, God uses creation as the example uh, of him being in control and him knowing what he's doing. Okay, in the book of Jonah, Jonah has an audience with God. He is right there. And Jonah is not impressed by God's mastery over creation. And and instead of repenting, Jonah says, no, you should still kill me because I'm mad that you're God. 
it's so and I know I know I can sit here I can sit here and like armchair quarterback this thing and it does not make sense to me it it doesn't make sense but I also know deep down in my heart that uh there are absolutely times in my life where I respond in this exact childish nonsensical temper tantrum way uh you know when things don't go my way but it, it doesn't just like no. cognitively reading it it does not make sense it it doesn't and we have to the work of the spirit in our lives is to keep us from scoffing at jonah because jonah is also left open ended because it's it's meant to be a rhetorical question for the reader what do mm. i do at this point and in you know if if you if you can if you can bring yourself to some introspection if you can bring yourself to some self examination then what you end up noticing is that i do this all the time yeah and you know as a pastor i've i've taught this book a number of times i've studied this book extensively and how frequently as a pastor that this is my response uh to god in my life and uh even this last year i had i had i and my family had a really tough fall like september through december was just one bad thing happening to us after another bad thing and you know you you're a pastor serving a congregation you're trying to put on a happy face you're trying to practice what you preach to your congregation you're trying to suffer well and eventually i had just been beaten over the head so much i i i finally was praying okay god what gives what yeah. have i done wrong that you're you're doing all these things and 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 at that point you got to let the message hit you is like you are missing the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Hmm. I like God's little bit here at the very end, the the sort of open question um, where he says, you know, you're this upset about a plant that you had nothing to do with. Like, of course, <laughs> yep. I'm going to be concerned with a whole city of people, livestock, that I had everything to do with, you know? Well, the, I, I think maybe the four most damning words in all of Jonah for us and for Jonah are the last four words. Uh, ESV renders it and also much cattle, mm. and also many and, animals in uh, mine. Yeah, yeah. It's and you you go back to chapter three. Remember, even the animals repented. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, w we would say probably in clumsy English, they were repented, right? That they were brought in as a part of the repentance. But theologically speaking, that's how the Spirit works on us. We are repented when the Spirit right. applies law and gospel to our lives. Uh, and, and God is, is hammering Jonah. It's like, look, even the cattle are getting it right. Why wouldn't I have pity on them? Yeah. Well, and also, even the cattle are getting it right. Why can't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, to, to, to recap... Jonah had his own special storm. <laughs> Jonah had his own special fish. Jonah had verbatim a sermon written by God that he had to preach and that worked immediately. And was he had his own special effective. plant. He had a hundred percent effective. He had his own special plant. He had his own special worm, and he had his own special wind. Again, the book the the. The, the the book begins and ends with the wind of God, the spirit of God working on Jonah. And uh, we don't know the outcome. <laughs> what a wild little book. Oh, my goodness. I love it. <laughs> you, uh, I mean, you can really dig out some good, some good stuff, you know? Well, you know, 
Remy, if we came back in three months and did another three-part series on Jonah, we could fill three episodes talking about nothing that we talked about right now, and we still wouldn't have scratched the surface. That's amazing. That's so wonderful. And I'm also so glad to hear that you want to be back in three months to do another three-part series on Jonah again. <laughs> I'm glad we have that booked. I've got Sign it. Me I up. literally recorded you <laughs> saying it. So you have to do it now. <laughs> That's so good. I love it, man. This see, this is the kind of Bible study that like I really love. Just like really digging into something and pulling out just like milking it for everything you can. That's so great. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, how why would we handle the word of God in any other way? I mean, it's fine to yeah. be devotional and it's fine to just read it. But if if the word of God is our life, you know, we, we better eat well at the buffet. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Pastor, thank you so much for taking us through Jonah. That was wonderful. Thank you for having me. I love it. Um. Anything uh, that you want to go ahead? We do this every episode, but let's go ahead. Anything you want to yep. plug? Uh, two websites. My uh, my podcast is Being Lutheran, beinglutheran.com on all platforms. You can check us out. We're walking through article by article through the Book of Concord. Um, we're 330-some episodes in right now. And mm -hmm. also... Uh, Check out the, the Bible college and seminary I teach at, especially uh, for high school students not knowing where they want to go for college and, and wanting to really study the Bible uh, in an in-person. It's the Free Lutheran Bible College. It'd be flbc.edu. Excellent. Very good. And for those of you on video, you may have noticed the drip, this amazing hat. Uh, Lutheran Answers new merch just dropped. Feel free to pick some up. Uh, Pastor, thank you, sir. And uh, we'll see you around. Thank you.